beautiful evenings. Uh, I'm Karen Alkali Goot. I'm really glad that you're all still here and, and we're still here. And I'm really happy to welcome you on behalf of the Israel Association of Writers in English to an evening I've been anticipating for well over two years. Now, two years ago in October, I was in New York and I saw a notice for a reading with Simon Lichman and Ron, Ron Price. I really wanted to go, but by chance I had a lecture to give that evening and I missed it. Last year in March, my husband and I returned from Egypt awaiting a reading with Simon in Jerusalem and another poet as a return to Western civilization. It was, it was scheduled for Mark, March 15th had all the markings of being a remarkable event and was postponed due to lockdown. I've been waiting ever since. So it's a long delayed pleasure to be here and to introduce veteran poets, Simon Lichman and Ron Price tonight. I'm gonna to introduce them together and then I'm gonna shut up and enjoy the evening with you. Simon Lichman, who was born, as he has just said, in London in 1951, has lived in Jerusalem since 1971. He's the founding executive director of the Center for Creativity and Education and Cultural Heritage. It's a, a nonprofit organization in Jerusalem, which brings together Israelis and Palestinians, Jewish and Arab communities through education programs based on folk, uh, folklore. In addition to having taught at almost every university in the country, he's given numerous master classes at colleges in the US. He's, he's served as chair of the Israel Association of Writers in English, edited a number of uh, issues for the journal ARC that um, is, was this time edited by by Michael and Noel Kanan. Uh, his poetry has appeared in numerous journals and collections such as, the collection is such as uh, Snatch Days. And his recent work includes The Harrowing, focused on his family's Holocaust experience, uh, Entertaining Angels, and others. I mean, Simon is a very busy man, person. Now, Ron is, uh, was born in New Orleans, right? He's currently a teaching artist at the Juilliard School in New York. He's published at the, in the American Poetry Review, The Dream of Every Poet, Leviathan Quarterly, and many other journals. He's, he's a past USIA visiting poet to Belgium, He's read in India for the Bureau of Cultural and Educational Affairs. And he's given readings in Jerusalem at the invitation of the American Cultural Center. He's, he's the author of A Crucible for the Left Hand, A True Account of the Failure of Bodies to Adequately Burn. And a, last month, I think, a small song called Ash from the Fire. I've heard was nominated for the Pulitzer and the American Book Award. Uh, and we're gonna hear from those, those poems tonight. So I'm gonna stop now, take it away. Simon, Lichman, Ron Price, and all of you enjoy the evening. Simon, you have to unmute. Oh, and the rest of you, of course, will stay unmute. Um, just, Ron was actually, um, um, grew up in first. Memphis, right? We, we, you were born in uh, Millwall? Anyway, he grew, actually grew, didn't grow up in New Orleans, he grew up in Memphis. Um, which, uh, anyway, so Ron and I basically have come from very different environments. And while he played in the woodlands of Memphis, Tennessee, I was climbing trees, the, cli the trees of Stanmore Common, which is near London. We met in Philadelphia, as you can see from the invitation, 
Um, and we've been reading poems back and forth ever since. We envisage this evening as a journey through the landscapes of our lives, loosely associated with place. So we're going to do like 15 minutes, Ron, 15 minutes, Simon, 15 minutes, Ron, 15 minutes, Simon. So over to you, Ron. Okay. Uh, this first set of poems, it's set in a place called Nankana County. Nankana is a Choctaw word for seer or prophet and a Chickasaw term for both home and coming home. Uh, the center of Nankana County is Memphis, but it stretches over across the Mississippi River into Arkansas and down into the northern part of the Mississippi Delta. This first piece is called First Story. What I meant to say got lost in the river. It rose from the shoreline among tree stumps, beer cans and cigarette butts, shards of bottle glass, the abandoned skin of a water moccasin. It drifted off hovering above the water as if to compose itself, started to whirl and spin, got sucked below in the seething drag and swinge of an undertow. I must have stood a long time on the shore while traffic crossed the bridge, driving into the evening sun. I knew what I did not say then. I knew the river said it better. It had to do with beginning and ending and beginning again, the snake the beautiful snake set it milky with a paste of mucus and dead cells slipping from under a cracked slab of concrete in ragged, undulant lines towards the water. As if it were hungry and knew what to do, it went into the river looking for a frog or a fish or maybe to avoid the heel of a son of Adam. This next piece is called Willow Bend. And it begins with an epigraph, uh, a couple lines of a, from a poem of uh, Etheridge Knights. And those lines say, and I ain't never stopped loving no one. Oh, I never stopped loving no one. Willow Bend. A tar paper cat house and bar poised on a bluff along the river. A woman stands on the veranda wearing a slip. She leans against the railing and cools her neck with a glass of iced tea. It is dusk. It is August heat. The clouds are low down gray, no bird call, no flies, no cricket pulse. The scent of rain hovering like a John who won't get on with it. The river is often low this end of summer. The stench of floodwaters swollen with uprooted trees, sewage pipes, a quilt, a car door, the roiling carcasses of drowned pigs, mules and deer bellied up among the 10,000 snakes and sealed coffins bobbing in the current suck and rush toward the second death. What wasn't carried into the gulf and from there to the sea took root in the mud of our flesh. And now that mud is drying, frail breath into dust, into stories like, right at the moment I came to fear water, I built an alt altar to fire. Wrong, I guess. I didn't know what else to do. She walked by lighting a cigarette and I followed her down the stairs. I know it. I followed her. I come here when I am empty and longing to be filled by anything but longing. When what I am loses hold of the willow, bending its branches, dipping into the river. This is called Versions of My Father's Disappearance into a Hawk. A highway motel, a man alone in bed with a chill congruent to March fog at dawn. He lies in a shabby room, his hands trembling, falling rain, violent thunder, pale before the bitter tears of a young man who is his father dead at a roadside motel in Birmingham. A double bed in a single room, outside Birmingham, a flask of Cutty Sark and the radio and the radio, 
the women I come from believe the dying give their final creature breath to whatever is near and needs it. The maid found him at noon, his hand reaching toward the window as if he were waving to the spotted hawk circling the field next to his motel. The pitch of its call came as I grew older to underscore the silence of a man dead in a motel room, a flask of Cuddy Sark in the, on the nightstand next to the radio that plays. It plays for anyone not listening to the hawk. This is called a crucible for the left hand. A night sky, speckled yellow stars on the back of a spider waiting for flies. Let me start over. A crucible for the left hand. A night sky, speckled yellow stars on the back of a spider waiting for flies. And I went off following a sound spun out of not knowing to fear. Let the hawk swoop, let slugs burrow the skull of a mole, let hunger blossom eating its pig entrails. Let hunger blossom eating the pig entrails he gave up trying to read. One dance, he said, pirouettes along a feckless edge where what we fear stumbles and falls and makes of us our death. Yeah, she said, you keep on with that fool talk. What's a graceful death among the dead? Words save nothing. Rainwater on the grass, on the leaves of the dying elm. This is no song of dry bones. A claw scratches and clasps a wet stone, small twigs smeared in its bloody fur. A wounded raccoon dragging its bones from a roadside ditch toward cowslip, through cowslip and weeds toward any dark tree at the edge of the field. She found the right hand of a man cut off and tossed in the weeds, gave it to me, said I'd know what to do. I nailed the hand to this poem. This is called Rita's Ghost. The hand that held the stone is empty, the stone dry, blood on your hand dry. So you carry emptiness like a stone against the betrayal pursuing your dreams, confusing grief with blood dry between your fingers under your thumbnail. You survived because you can speak without revealing what you think, because your laughter turned to a sneer. It was raining, you built your foundation on smoke and now you have an aloof disdain to show for it. A few bottles of wine, attendees at a wake, you're adrift. A smoldering wound, and I am your bitter salt, dressed up as kin, no flute, these words. I prophesy you will go on a listless breeze without memory, clawed and syllabled, folded like laundry into an afterlife of dry stones, if you do not forgive the sound of your footsteps. You know, what you don't understand, what you outwitted, still has you by the scruff of the neck, and it is not finished with you. And this last piece in this set is called non of Primitive. Winter light says it is safe here on the rotting hull of the John boat, upside down and moored half in water to weeds, dead leaves and mud said farewell to over and again. Isn't this what it means to come home Sun low in the sky beyond the levee, an eagle crossing over the water, its wings curved toward dusk. Isn't this an image of what remains to remind nothing is forever, not the solitary boy on the far shore, slowly reeling in his line, not the winter reluctance of bass, not even this boat snake's claim, April light, August dark, safe or not, this boat, this abandoned snake hunt echoes wind rippling lake water and light. The eagle, flown into its shadow, glides past the levee, and the boy on the far shore stands where I stood 17 winters before. He waves to me with my left hand, casting his line, dispensing blessings on the wretched muck and dreck of a heart 
where bass in the still depths wait. I think that deserves everyone to go off mute and to give a round of applause at the end of this. Wonderful. Thank you. Well done. Let's just breathe for a minute before we go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So everyone, please go back on mute. Thank you, bro. Okay. Shall I shall I start, Michael? Just a sec. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'm I'm gonna start in England and this poem reflects a sort of mixed background of English nursery rhymes and Bible stories. A snatch day of England. In my after, and the sight of ease with which to fold the knotted skies into the mix forget me blue, hills to be blown over sea like seeds of an antique grandmother's clock, face of sun racing through hallways jumbled with jumping cows and swinging mules, where picture frames cut loose from backdropped crystal, the drought that brought the brothers to him saying, we beg of your plenty and will return the gift in kindness for see we have no wealth our heads are bowed our harvests have not dealt us well beachy somebody's got one minute one minute one minute yeah oh, okay great thanks beachy head and you feel like flying if I fell from the sky to the sky to the floor, narrow reaches of gilded rock, thin gullies broken into beaches, lapped into curves, like grass on hilltop, falling into autumn, brown beneath, where white rocks chalk a line between the sun and the silver sand. So Ravana and I lived in Leeds for three years. This poem has a reference to, um, uh, to three of Alan Silito's works, Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner and Billy Liar. Grey uh, of place and fortune, greyer and gloomier that night, blackness seeping up from the empty mines beneath the city's centre, brought by the silent runner from the distance of loneliness, pressed between Saturday's late nights and still Sunday mornings, where Billy the Liar's dreams escape into fog flung by the flying Scotsman that could have taken him to sunlight, we had not gone again. Layers of boiled cabbage and bacon soured our clothes, lined shared banisters, whirled within the wallpaper and carpeting. Our neighbours downstairs knifed and tongued, and outside every man near Hare Hills Park could have been the Yorkshire Ripper, raincoat, muffler, Trilby, solid with the eye of resignation. In the off-licence we said, that one please will be perfect. Do you sell much of it? Few bottles during the year. Does it want wrapping flour? On our kitchen table, a camel blinked from the Negev desert. Sweet, kosher, kiddish wine, bottled, I Zygmunt, Mr Zygmunt. A quiet man who brightened Shabbos mornings with sweets he carried for the children. In brilliant, airy rooms, we welcome visitors from below. Come, take a seat by Mr. Zygmunt, noticing in the morning how the level of wine had hardly dropped at all. On to Philadelphia. In this poem, Vince is Vincent van Gogh, obviously. Dado is Medigliani, it's what his friends called him. And I used to describe living in Philadelphia as being under an Egged bus in the Tel Aviv um, uh, central bus station with the engine running in the height of summer. What did you do today, dear? How many paintings were left unpainted? How many times did Vince or Dado looking at the scene say, no, not today, I couldn't bear it. Or Leonardo, espying beauty on the piazza, think to himself, oh shit, 
If I go on like this, I'll never have time for a bath, a cup of tea or a glass of absinthe. Was the symphony left unfinished because Schubert just couldn't get down to it and we whimsically think he died on the job? The job. What is the job? How do I transplant cherry blossoms from an English springtime into the loveliness of your American smile? Or invoke words of old with lips of new? Really, who's to say thou art more lovely than a temperate breeze on a Philadelphian summer's day, 120 degrees and 100% humidity? I have an uneasy feeling that sometimes, when it comes to the taste of life, a long, cool Coca-Cola cut with a sliver of lemon is the only thing worth contemplating in the world. This is a poem that um, the next poem has had been germinating since 1974 when there was the Yom Kippur War here and uh, President Allende in Chile was overthrown um, uh, um, by Pinochet. And um, during that a revolution, all of Pablo Neruda's unpublished work were taken and burned. And a few months later, he died. I was it, Suddenly, the poem came to me in Philadelphia, God knows why, and I was driving... Um, beside the L, you know, it's elevated railway, and I was going through the pillars and the poem was coming and I, I really had to write it down. I couldn't stop anywhere, so I was sort of driving and writing like that. It's called You Can Still Hear the Sea Through a Broken Shell. We will not die, hearts cut out and spattered over military walls or burnt on pyres of manuscripts too dangerous for the folk to hear. Our songs are of the earth and sky and have no need of reconstruction, resurrection. Only we will sing them when we can no longer hear, calling out your peace of mind against the dolphins' free and easy gamble, binding us to burning Chile meat. Words, 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 without the blind lead life wisdom of the molten tongue poured into the casting of a bell and through our throats rung until they take us too they take us too and you my friend will forge my metal into the blood song of your own heart singing love when i come round to your door please let me in for we are all in need of shelter now and now on to a different landscape. This is the landscape of my children when they were young. This poem is basically, loosely based on a very popular board game, which will remain nameless. False start. Get up, feed the cat, feed the frogs, go into the garden, feed the rabbits, hope the children fed themselves, settle down to a nice cup of tea, land on go. That's the ticket. Get up. Excavate the cornflakes, slosh the milk into a jug, cut bread for sandwiches, take a chance, wash two mugs, break bread with too cold butter from the fridge, go back three places, find clothes in laundry stacks, coax kids into various sizes, take another chance, put the kettle on, change the kids from the smear of breakfast, miss next turn, feed the frogs to the cat, the cat to the rabbits, return to jail. When they pass go, plummet to the couch. The phone rings in the kitchen. I'm in jail. I can't move at all. Um, this is for Shlomit and Jay. On the other hand, there's this. The children go away for the night. You think you'll settle down to work, write some poems, edit a manuscript or two. Instead, you clear the dishes from the sink, cook some supper, put away the clothes and watch a slump of TV. You cannot move into bed, and before you know it, light filters through the blinds and birds rise in the sky. They're not too tired to fly today. Driving to school with Mika. Eyes just above the window line. Look at those flowers, Daddy. Aren't they lovely? Tulips from Amsterdam. I pause so as not to sing the song. And those, Daddy, what are those? I do not know their names, little girl, but ragged and dainty, we have passed them often, myrtle or sage, and like you, beautiful in their dusty search for sun. Gabriella, with the scent of tiger balm from your lips, face cupped in my hands, 
despite the pens, I hold all day bright eyes full of the unsure mischief of half-cornered cubs at play. New Year's poem for Celli. With clouds scudding across the sky and you saying, what lovely weather, Daddy, does it look like rain? We make new promises. I say, as I catch a guilty slouch away from that gently tilting bookcase, I won't lose patience in the morning, nor dream of bedtime from the early afternoon. Instead, we'll monster until dawn and in the milk skies of dawn, read all the books your sleepy heads can hold. I mean, my darlings, how long can it last that all the confidence you require lies in your mummy's and your daddy's arms? And of course, they do grow up. So this is again Chelly, filled with the overwhelming presence of this very child, bared in the beauty of sleeping off helter-skelter nights. I tiptoe in to ensure the duvet isn't on the floor in the cold snap of early morn plant a kiss on graveled cheek so that tomorrow or the next day he can leave without having known this coming back, this letting go, this birthday gift, this taken for granted thing. Mika, the lingering warmth of the kettle tells me in your morning rush for bus, you just had time for tea. Shall I pour it out and start fresh two hours on? or reboil the water, and despite the slight metallic taste, savour the knowledge that we drink from the same well. Gabriella, with each song reflecting yet another facet of what you took from me, or rather what I gave, or what came from the not taking, not giving in separately connected directions, determined by invisible threads of oneness. And these last four poems are from um, a manuscript called The True Tale of Puddlesome Sniff, who was otherwise known as Puddles, Homecoming or Me'urav Yerushalmin. So they ask for a dog and I say, fine, but who's going to walk it late at night or first thing in the morning? Ah, they say, we'll do, you know, one time, one time, full of young certainty, but definitely not a shepherd. And we put the time of acquisition off and off until one day Mika, home from school, announces my classmates' dogs had puppies we have to go and see. When? I say, somewhat startled. Yet on the Friday afternoon, with Shelley and Gabriella missing all sorts of other fun, the mum casually throws a large box into the boot of the car with a small packet of dog food, just in case. What kind of a dog, I ask? Well, the mother's a Belgian shepherd, but the father's a Labrador. We all love labs. The owners explain that there are only two puppies left, the withdrawn dreamy black and the multi-tan, the most adventurous, which is why she's still here. Her head was half crushed, crushed by a closing door and her legs a little lame from we don't know where, who has made a crooked beeline across the yard to plop herself into Mika's lap. Well, you wanted them to see me. When we going home? It's hard to know just how old a being you are. If it's one times seven for the first 10 years, then one times five up to the accelerated end, so that at 15, you are 93. And in the course of one more of our years, you become 104, much as 12 months for a five-year-old is five minutes for me, or three seconds for someone in their 90s. So I ask my trusty friend, reclining on the coolness of early evening tiles, from your perspective, how old am I? Me and the dog grew old together, old together. As I watch her drag her bulk upstairs or stand at the top, do I have to go down? Creaking knees and grating shoulder bones, unless she sees a cat. And then the years roll off her back, her fur rises, her bellows howl, and she's off at the pace of her prime. I ask myself, where's my cat? What might be said? I have to remind myself that you were a dog, 
And yet the hole in my days and nights, the not rhythm of walks and feeding, the not mad dash to freedom, torn terror of the neighbourhood, these vanished things beyond repair. Desolate, over a dog. Perhaps they think, how stupid. But this friend would roam and wait, consider and decide, laugh at top-heavy crows and peacocks flapping from the chase. They'll say, dogs don't laugh, but we know they do. Oh, yes, we do. You can befriend wild things, birds and beasts, plants and trees, and they will join or receive you with a majesty of shade and hue. But spaces in our home suggest a coming and a going, a giving and a getting. Only love can understand. Thank you for that set. Round of applause, please. Beautiful, Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Beautiful. Very nice. Hold on. Who is that? That's Simon. <laughs> no, Ben. <laughs> Coming. Okay, ben. everyone back on mute, please. <laughs> ah, hello. <laughs> Okay, back to Ron, just a moment. Thanks, Simon. And I want to thank Michael and Karen too, and all of you for including me in this wonderful reading. This first uh, poem starts off in uh, at Calhoun and Beale in Memphis, a couple blocks from the Mississippi River, and ends up on uh, Avenue C and 14th Street uh, along the East River, a couple of blocks from the East River. And it sort of just drifts around from Memphis to Philadelphia, to New York City. It is north into winter. It is a side street south of Schwab's general store on Beale between Cotton Row, the old Lorraine Motel, and St. Patrick's Church. It is after the agrarians harvest. Remember, they cultivated the word tradition instead of moonlight, substituted the odor of order for magnolia. They're dead, and Furry Lewis is dead. Elvis is dead. Ma Rainey II and little Laura Dukes dead or with Slim in Paris. Three gray-haired black men and two white boys hunch over an empty park in an empty parking lot. The white boy in a red polyester suit throws the dice, snake eyes. Brown Mississippi River water twists and flows toward the Gulf. The fish of what is headed north bucks against the current. All afternoon, a hawk inscribes circles in the air above a red barn in a field where mice st scramble and br under, among brown corn stalks. Limestone quarries, sulfur, and the hawk's glare. Its eyes are the prism of a strip miner gazing through his garden of slag heaps. Dutch elms stand like ragged Confederate uniforms guarding the garden, the, bar the barn with a collapsed roof, the rusted silo, a gutted 59 Ford truck. Gray clouds and a cool breeze silk screen the trees blue as the cry of a hawk, the same blue the spruce knows with its love rooted in loneliness. Snow and dusk touch the summit of Blue Mountain. Night descends on the wings of the bald eagles that once nested these peaks. Somewhere on the other side of these mountains, the spirit of Charlemagne is drunk on the fumes of the Delaware River. Whatever drove off those great winged birds is there too, buried in the snow of religious belief. Signs in the city of desire, a flop house by the Lincoln Tunnel, love thy neighbor, do it here. A tenement wall in the Bronx, Vinnie Joe Cupcake can cook his meatloaf in my oven any time. Signifiers, from the time of human generation and not the seasons of earth. Real estate value. You are 38 miles downriver, downwind from a nuclear plant.
This next poem is called Song of Passage. How long I have been wetting the stone with spit and sweat from my body. It is smooth, very smooth to be so hard. Or maybe not. Maybe only what is hard inside can have such a smooth surface. Maybe my love of what is rough, ragged, torn is a love for the part that did not turn to stone on the day I looked back and saw the land I knew burning to ash and smoke dissolving in air. What I lost that day, what I left behind, the stone I carry under my tongue. I took it out, I take it out of my mouth and rub it whenever I need fare through this realm, the dead call the living. This is, uh, the title of this is the Dark Around San Julian La Pav, which is a small church in the Latin Quarter in Paris. The Dark Around San Julian La Pav. A man and a woman sit at a small sidewalk cafe in the Latin Quarter. It is almost midnight. A half block away, flames shoot up out of the crowd into the air from the mouth of a fire eater. Couples and small groups and a few solitary walkers wander past the lit windows of closed storefronts. Next to the Greek restaurant displaying a pig turning on a black spit, a greasy skinned harpoonist stands with his left hand cupping his crotch, a sneer on his face that says, how many of you think you aren't turning on your own spit? The man and woman sit without longing to be somewhere else. They have forgotten whatever harm they suffered at another's hand. They do not wish they were younger or older. There is no one they envy. They sit at a small table, each filled with the pleasure of the other's voice, sharing the last of the wine poured from a carafe into a single glass. Soon enough, it will be time to sleep. Soon enough, even if they do not cease to love one another before they wake, death will come. They know it, though they are far from the grave, and they loathe death. No longer children, almost half their lives old, they know a moment will come, they will spill or be poured out of this life that happens once only in bodies fragile as glass waiting to shatter. They sit at their small table, having learned to laugh about what they no longer hate, fear. This next poem is part of a sequence. Um, the title of the sequence is Letters to the Danaid, and it's sort of set at 9-11 in New York. I searched through twilight, scented the color of ripe plums, walked the steps where we sat that night in the park, the trees drinking the dark underside of leaves, moonlit and flashing, homesick for a place that was never home, and went back to my apartment and fell asleep reading your imaginary letter, dreaming a voice delicate as wine or blood, the city in flames, the towers fallen, our lives together or apart, nothing, an indulgence neither of us could buy. That place we found is still there, buried in ash under ideologies and melted steel. The, that flashing, your voice gone the night you opened to me, gone into a sky lit with dead stars. I brood on the seared bones of absence. Having lost you the way all things survive because our names are not drawn out of dreams any more than rainwater washing ash off the leaves of the honey locust. I wanted your fingers on my lips when I died. And this is uh, another sort of after 9-11 trying to explain to my daughter who is not only just now getting old enough to be able to understand 9-11. Uh, I wrote these because I didn't expect her to be able to, to deal with it and understand it when she was four or five. First spring after the end. 
It had nothing to do with blood or guilt, nothing to do with family. I wanted a small personal voice under stars no closer, the moon no further off than millennia before, where the good earth continues according to its time, the ground not paved with ice and anxiety because it is still winter. I needed to connect with something older than beginning. There is a moment, and when it comes, we lie down between cypress knees or keep on, meaning, I suppose, whatever it is that tells a man your mother's loving arms can no longer protect you. I was sick of a God who does nothing to heal what his love has wounded. I felt battered. So much failure and death, they made a hole. An absence I understand is the presence of God in the universe. I kept explaining to no one in particular, if it were more than air these hands keep reaching through, then it would not be this room of gray light, and this weight would not feel like a stone divided by falling rain. Still winter, though a mood in my body like the need to care and not care had begun to thaw. All afternoon, Red wings chased crows away from their nests among the reeds along the marsh where mallards drifted, drifted, a place defying my anxiety that keeps expressing itself through the seasons that pass without end, the flowers that bloom without reason, early meadow rue, yellow genestra, blue forget-me-not, lilac. Um, Simon found the brotherly part of Philadelphia when he was there. I found mostly what brothers do to each other in the Old Testament. This is called Philadelphia Song. We are not flowers, we are not dew. Those of us who came through have forgotten more than we remember. The night clear, the room still, a man twists in bed sheets, rolls over, twists, stretches back, the black moon, the dark between stars. Lately, I've been holding myself like a lost child whose body shudders after long weeping, and the wind makes incomprehensible music over onion grass, and the ground says, still winter, and the clouds, more snow, and the crocus, a white crocus in snow. It is like the man who wakes after a voice in his dream said, you failed and blame your failure on others and that makes you a coward. There is nothing timid about a crocus. It blossoms, without, it blossoms despite the scholarship of snow and I am sick of scholarship. I want to open like a spear of onion grass or a shallot or a beet that might feed someone who needs more than white blossoms. And this last poem is called Song of Opening for Kate. Her hands are always the first time, rough leaves of a willow tree beside the river's troubled current. More than once they have revived a sore heart, outlived the endless battering they struggled through. I tell you persimmon, wolf river, panther trace, and what comes out, the screech of a peacock, caged thunder, cathedral light. Her hands making milk of the sadness in dumb animals. They are why water is the way in, fire the way out. They are the lines, the angles of desire, the wine of goodwill, her hands, the ultimate proof Though the gods love to watch us scratch, God is essentially erotic. Her hands, the caterpillar slowly evolving dream of wings. I sing thanks to the black bear, praise to the woodchuck on your hands. Not long, thin, I tell you, peasant hands, fingers I kiss, hands I trust with a child. I tell you, hands I trust. I tell you, hands. Thank you. Well, wow. thank you. Wow. You go off mute. Yeah. <laughs>
Take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> Holding my breath all the way through your reading, I have to breathe. <laughs> Whew. Beautiful. Okay. So now for the final set from Simon, please uh, return to your muteness, um, all but Simon. Yeah. Oh. One minute. Yeah. This poem, uh, the, the next four poems come from a, a sequence called The Punished Wound, which is a, a reference to Dennis Silk's collection of poetry called The Punished Land. Um, and this poem was written before the piece with Jordan. Beyond the Furs and Fountain. It is these views where a sea sunk into its depths of salt, pearls oleander, sage and oak, Mountains chipped into the tracks of wild gazelle, a ridge of paintbrush evergreens carved from light along an edge of branch within a thin blue sky, blown to almost chalk, rising in the distant rows of Jordan. These things I have known, calmness as a crumpled edge of cuff shown from maroon sleeves of a Greek jersey, church bells tolling hours, muezzin call, and mumbled ma'arives, a blue red bag balanced as an easel on the knees, olives bent into their crook of sun, stairs of hand-picked stone down to bedrock run, single seeds of summer space in sycamore clung, small things that raise small flickers in the heart. We are the flotsam of closed borders thrown up in the arms of a dying sea. We comb our separate shores for trophies, rustling desert attics. Small things, to be sure. We cannot stand a row of trees out from the light by saying fur, blue, day. And peace is just a word. This was written in a hospital waiting room where there was a, a nun playing with her rosary and an elderly Muslim man um, with his prayer beads. Arthritic beads holding the thread of life they tease meaning out of the quiet chink of sacred digits that separate this thing from the other this name of god from this friday prayer that thursday afternoon this day of hope from all other days in which we worry away the rose slipping off the frayed edge of the order we enclose well, the work I do takes me to lots of places, and this poem is based in a small Palestinian village um, with the children. Um, you should know that my name, uh, Simon, is actually Shalom, and that's the name I received uh, at birth, my Brit, um, after my great-grandfather. Um, in England, at that time, in the early, early 1950s, all the Shaloms were Stephen or Simon, so I got Shalom. You couldn't go to school in England with a name like Shalom, you know, what's your name? Peaceful. What's your name? Hello. So Simon worked best. Shalom. They beat their tiny wings against my back, according to the pace of running after. To say those little things in words too few we share. Thank you, Simon. How are you, Simon? They like to use my name. But it is not enough to stand between what is and all that was, is not enough to keep the roads paved and the fields intact. Yet I will pit the promise of this name against the gathering clouds of summer snow that rots the roots of all we grow. Root 317. Acrid smell of rubbish burning somewhere in the hills beyond the road past Hebron. End of sky fade, grey-green-brown, 
dry walls surrounding olive trees and grapevines. Were it just this calm, you come to my land, I'll come to yours. Um, these next few poems on the subject of where one writes, these next um, few poems were written during various concerts while I was marvelling at just how composers hear their art. So it's called whatever it's called or from wherever it comes and it's dedicated to Baruch um, after the Ave Virum of Mozart. The way it creeps out of a majesty of nowhere into full-flighted, multi-voiced engagement with all that is holy, a complete harmony of time and space and the organisms held by this in place. After Beethoven's trio in G minor, opus one, number two. I've always wanted to say that, opus one, number two. The opening wrench of Nigun, talkback piano, cello violin, gospel moves, rock and roll, refracted into see the sky, possible. See the stars, possible. Feel the sun, feel the frost, drip of day towards finale, relief of being here, just here. And this is after Benjamin Hoffman playing Mozart's Sonata Number no. 11 in A major. Because music can induce or calm frenzy seeping from the eye, where blades of grass dance interlocked airways to find the sun without disturbing other blades of grass turning towards the centre of their breath. For it is the gentlest of hands alive to an intention laid down centuries ago as if it was clear that life could not go on without it, sunken into an almost 70-year-old child gazing at his first butterfly. After Kiri in Schubert's Mass in G Major, uh, the Bel Canto Choir of Jerusalem, with my wife singing uh, in, um, in the Jerusalem Oratorio in the Church of St. Vincent de, de Paul. To be free for the fresh breath of poetry in the response of tree, register of stone, shape of cloud, embodiment of mass as of the very young mother gazing upon the dead world in her arms, leaden hope on her lap, foreshadowed in fold of cloth, path of eye telling grief. And I remember them, oh how I remember them, heady scent of earthbound play, in glazed moment of this is who we are, tunnelling in the sand, dreaming wings, beads slung, parent clung, daddy, it's my daddy. For death is the compass of how we take the breeze of leaves, bluster of days, staccato flow of bodies in transcendent flights of bees, droning goldwoods into the arm of this very now, now, now. There's an oblique reference to a famous song here and to a film, Tell Them Willie Boy Was Here. For I'm still here to stay, Storm pure or dragged into the Frankie thing and Willy boys sway because a little sunlight goes a long, long way to the warming of bones, the flow of blood, enterprise of brain coiled into a newness, settling within the strain of glowing thunder. What's the difference between one path and the next, one sentence and the last? when atoms exchange flawed perceptions of what we expect to be and how we want to go. Because these are the days of burning from who knows where, London, Egypt, Jerusalem, air, star and quicksand, earth and seed, tree and bird, nesting and in flight. I have lived a stunning sight. The next two poems are eulogies. This is to a, a young member of our family who died a, a year ago. For Eli. Of sweetness and wing. There are angels we do not understand who fly within the burnished glory 
of a sun reflected through halo hair, furled around their presence, smiling in the secret knowledge of life as it should be, who see the underside and cannot, who knows why, cannot break free. And this last poem is to my very dear friend who died exactly a year ago. Um, the watercolour on the advert, uh, sorry, on the invitation is one of his paintings. So for me, this is a, a homage to him. What's that? And I awake to the grim reality of a world without you in the bird song or early flush of dawn, the becoming day, the indoor outdoor cats at play. Begin with Derek. Begin with a smile at the other end of a university corridor. Begin with the questions of an immense intellect, carefully crafted essays and points of view within the mature elegance of wingback chairs and draped hues. Begin with reading poetry and painting, how this image came together, how that vase on the table was achieved. See the gentlest soul through velvet eyes, playing grains of sand and trailblazing searches for the wild flowers of spring. Begin with this, then move into sharing Shabbat walks in the fields surrounding Ramat Rachel and the valley of Tzor Bacher, when the dogs would wonder and we'd exchange our weeks, think through our years to come. Begin with loss, this one long scar this gash, this desolation. Thank you. Please tell us his name. Derek. His name is Derek Stein. Derek Stein. Please everybody unmute. Simon. <laughs> Michael and Karen, thank you so much. Thank you. And Ron, of course. Um, you know, and uh, all people from all over the world. This is just amazing. I, I mean, I just have loved, loved seeing your faces. Thank you. Wow. Love hearing your voice. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a question. Yes. We didn't prepare for a Q&A, but I'm going to ask Ron. The theme of water, river, water, river, decomposition, and hawks hmm. appear time and time again within your poems, as if you were Mark Twain um, <laughs> on the Mississippi. <laughs> tell us, tell us the inspiration of, of the river for you, or the water. I grew up close to the Mississippi River. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and when I came to Philadelphia, I adopted the Schuylkill River. And in the same kind of way, I've adopted the East River. <laughs> Please stay on mute, people. Can I have that? Please stay on mute. So I've, I have no idea why. <laughs> But I know it's a prerequisite to be settled in a place so that I have a relationship with the river. Thank you. I mean, I, I guess we would ask, answer other questions or comments if you, if anybody wants. There's, I mean, that's okay. And if not, we can go to bed. I mean, Ron, you can have your day. We can go to bed. <laughs> I've got a question. Uh, Hello. Wait, please identify yourself. Who is speaking? The guy waving right now. Okay. Ezra it's... from Family Mom. Yeah, for Ron, it's for Ron. Again, um, hawks and eagles come up a lot. And early on, you mentioned sort of the first people and natives. 
And I was wondering if there's any connection between their sort of law to do with actually the immense power of the ego and your sort of connection with the constant use of life and death and all of sort of yeah wow that sounds like a great review for a back of a book <laughs> i don't know how to answer your question um except to say that I grew up with hawks and crows all over the place. And they seem to lead me to New York City. <laughs> or at least to Blue Mountain, Pennsylvania. And the rest of the way I had to get there myself. But for the last three years or so, there are a group of hawks that are nesting in a church on Park Avenue in Manhattan. So maybe they followed me. That's a poem. <laughs> I'd like to ask you a question. How does one get in touch with you, Ron? I wrote, I wrote a book. Of Never mind. Anyway, I don't, anyway, how does one get in touch with you? Uh, Simon, Simon's got my address. Okay. And I, I have Simon's address. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Well, I think we want to thank you both for an amazing evening. That, uh, everyone has been inspired by you, that you're both so different and yet so 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 mutual so mutually uh fruitful and i really uh want to thank you both and i, I want to thank you ron for having been born in memphis and not in new orleans <laughs> <laughs> i really am sorry i kept that's so not to worry beale street and i forgetting where i was and so i mixed you up but uh i think that uh we have, if we have any questions, you can write, people can write it in the chat or can um, write to, uh, to Michael, um, write, write the questions to Michael Kagan and, and he will transmit them because it is kind of hard to find everybody in this great, uh, this great crowd, uh, this wonderful crowd. Uh, and I'm sure that they want even, the, they would even love to have you both say you know, say something to them about how you became to be mutual poets and uh, or poets that write together. Uh. Well, um, I've um, you know we hear about writers and living in garrets and starving and, and that kind of stuff and. I suppose I had once upon a time thought that might be the life. Um, but this was much better. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we were living in Philadelphia. I was actually finishing a PhD at, um, in folklore at the University of Pennsylvania. And we were living in a, in, a, in, a, in, in a building owned by a friend of ours who's also in one of these windows aiming. Uh, and Ron um, moved in to this building and I, I spent a lot of mornings, you know, trying to write my, my PhD. And, and then I, I realized that Ron was a poet, you know, and, and I was a poet. And so I would nip downstairs and I'd say, well, <laughs> how about reading some poems? Uh, you know, or Ron would nip upstairs. And uh, it just, you know, became that. And, um, it, you know, it's, it, it's really amazing if you find... Um, you know, a, a true ear for you uh, and, and somebody who can listen without commenting, but also make comments that are always to the point, um, which means that they've really got you, you know, they've really just found you, understood you. Um, and it was one of those coincidences or beshirt or, you know, fate, whatever. Um, my feeling was that we'd known each other 
from before birth. Ron, do you have a comment on that one? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That covers it. 